Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Get Secure. Today is the May 5th, 2014 edition, and happy Cinco de Mayo to those of you that are celebrating today. So I'm your host, Mike Blangiforti, and today we're going to talk a little bit about school safety um, and the importance of school safety, and let's give some school safety tips for those of you out there. I have no, no guests today, so I'll be flying solo, but it's my area of expertise to be talking about school safety, so let's talk about it. First of all, I, mean, I sit on a board at my daughter's school, and it's exactly on this. It's on school safety, how to keep our, how to keep our kids safe, how to keep our students safe. And it really runs the whole gamut from nursery school all the way up through uh, you know, a higher education and college. And unfortunately, in today's day and age, we're just seeing such a rise in school violence, uh, active shooters, stabbings, um, just, um, and, and some of the psychological elements that lead up to an active shooter um, <clears throat> in, in the schools. It's very important to recognize early. So, Taking into consideration the four phases of emergency management as it relates to school safety and as it relates to the active shooter, I just want to remind the folks out there about the four phases. One is mitigation or prevention. The second is preparedness. The third is response. The fourth is recovery. Okay, so let's isolate um, an active shooter scenario or a violent student scenario like the stabbings that took place recently. So let's address the first phase of emergency management, and that's mitigation or prevention. How do we prevent an active shooter, student, staff, or faculty member? How do we uh, prepare for it? Okay, so preventing. The MTA had an expression years ago after 9-11 that if you see something, say something. And if you watch Get Secure, you see that that's the theme of the show oftentimes, if you see something, say something. Oftentimes we don't. Oftentimes we have either a fear, an embarrassment, um, a reluctance or a hesitancy to say something. Because oftentimes it's the folks that are most close to the person who would be an active shooter or have this display of violence that are the most likely to make observations which I believe could help to prevent a scenario from happening. And it's very difficult for a friend, very difficult for a family member to say something. But our encouragement and our safety tip of today is say something. You very well may be able to prevent somebody from becoming so psychologically unstable that they lose regard for their own life and they lose and they have no regard for any other human life. So say something, because that's really the prevention here. It's identifying psychological markers when they happen. When we look at the history of active shooters, we see a trail of psychological issues. We see a trail of suicidal ideology, notes, um, diagrams, words, expressions, things that identify that somebody may have a propensity to violence. Somebody may have a propensity to take their own life. And, it's, and as much as it's a terrible feeling to have to be able to tell somebody about a close friend or a family member, my argument is how much more terrible is it if you didn't say something and that person commits a heinous act. And whether it's a heinous act on others or whether somebody takes their own life. So say something. That's really the, that's really the prevention part of active shooters. Really the prevention part of um, somebody who would commit school violence. So do something to prevent it from happening. We have to all be part of the same team, okay? And that's what I have to say about prevention. Let's move to the next stage, preparedness. How do we pre prepare our schools to keep our students safe in light of everything that's going on with school violence, with active shooters? So let's start, drills. So principals, educators, staff members that belong to any type of school out there, are you doing drills repeatedly to educate our students, educating your staff and your administrators as to what to do in a drill? Are we educating our students about an active shooter and how hard it is to speak about this to children 
uh, you know, there's a certain sensitivity, and you certainly don't want to frighten, but unfortunately, we're dealing with a harsh reality today where this can happen. I use the expression NIMBY all the time, N-I-M-B-Y, which is an acronym for not in my backyard. Everybody out there thinks that, well, yeah, I saw it on the news and it happened there, but it could never happen here, not in my backyard, not in my school, not in my place of business, just simply can't happen, which is kind of an ignorant way to think when you think about it. Because the truth of the matter is, and we hope that you're in a 99% uh, percentile that nothing does happen in your school, that nothing does happen in your place of business. But how would we feel if we're not prepared if we fall within that one percent? Don't adopt the NIMBY attitude, the not in my backyard attitude, because it's wrong. It can happen, it can happen anywhere, and it could happen in your school or your place of business. So we need to be prepared. And how are we prepared? Well, part of my job here at Arrow Security is uh, exactly that. We secure, we help to secure school districts, colleges um, across our great nation. And we take it very seriously. In my background, I was, I was uh, an associate vice president at a college covering uh, two campuses. School safety, campus safety became a priority. So we put measures in place to be prepared from camera systems to blue light phones. 24-7 uh, coverage by campus safety officers at both campuses. We provided an escort service, so if a student was maybe a little nervous, it was, it, was, um, it was after hours, it was dark out, and maybe have a little hesitance about walking to one's car, uh, that we would provide that escort. And myself as a parent and many parents out there, what a great service is that, to know that your children are safe or have the umbrella of being safe because of a physical presence of that campus safety officer or that security officer at whatever school that you go to, whether it's a grammar school or high school or what have you. I used to give um, speeches all the time for incoming students at the college. Um, I would have my segment at orientation. And one of the things I would tell parents, because you could only protect your children so much, we do, and we do everything as parents to make sure that our children are safe whenever they're with us, whenever they're under our control. But certainly when they go to school, we have to trust the educators, we have to trust the institution that they are just as concerned about my child's safety as they could possibly be. So one of the things I used to say at orientation all the time was, parents, uh, you've done a great um, service to your children by loving them and by protecting them up until this point and I want you to trust me with that responsibility when they come to this college. I want you to trust me with that. And, tr and, and, and parents and family entrusting me with their student safety is something that I took extraordinarily serious. As many, 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 if not all, campus safety directors, public safety, campus safety directors, and those that are in charge of children's safety in any school, I'm certain take just as serious. But we have to be more cognizant, and we have to be more understanding. We have to be more lacking of the NIMBY attitude. We have to run drills, educate our students, educate our staff, educate our faculty to the harsh reality that it can happen, and it can happen in your school. Um, so that being said, let's talk briefly about some of the things that cause schools to not have a good campus safety program or not have enough security. And it might be that they want it, they need it, uh, people are proponents of it, but the simple and harsh fact with that is that there is a cost associated with security. And it's a real problem. Um, you know, uh, for me personally, I wouldn't mind, uh, you know, as a parent, Paying an additional fee or an addition to a tuition for those that are in private institutions for a school safety fee to help to augment funds that are already in place for campus safety, student safety. I wouldn't mind paying that security fee to have a uniform guard, to have somebody that I know is there every hour that my child is in that school. I would have a comfort level. And can we place a price? on the safety of our kids. I say no, but there are many detractors out there. And the many detractors not only look at cost, 
but they're also looking at they don't want to have a so-called police state or security state or such a physical uniform presence in their school because of perception. Perception of what? Perception of what? In today's day and age with everything that's going on with school violence, um, the perception of having a uniform guard there and that being a negative? Well, I don't see it. I don't see it. Not in today's day and age. Stop adopting that attitude that it can't happen here. Can't happen here? Yeah, yes, it can. Look into, at least look into providing how much the cost is in providing a school safety officer, a campus safety officer. Take a look at it, at the very least. It's something that we specialize here in arrow security, uh, providing and screening some of the best people out there to protect the kids. So do that. Um, in the state of Illinois, they just gave a ton of money, millions of dollars in grant money for school safety. Um, what a bold move on, on, on the part of the state of Illinois to provide that money so that their students, uh, their staff, their faculty, their administrators could be that much safer. It's the state coming up and saying, yes, uh, we want to support safety efforts, so bravo, because that's where we need to be going. We can't be looking at funding and how much it would cost. There's another debate going on right now about teachers with weapons. I don't even know about that one. Um, teachers are civilians. Uh, civilians uh, generally are not trained in the proper use and safe use of firearms, and not, not everywhere. I mean, uh, there are some civilians that are very handy with fire, some former veterans that know their way um, about uh, everything about a firearm and how to handle it. Uh, former law enforcement that know about a firearm and how to handle it. But should we be putting the gun into the hands of teachers and principals? Well, that's up to the folks out there to vote on and for the folks out there to decide. Myself, I prefer to have a trained professional uh, securing my school. So it's just something to think about. I'm going to switch gears for a second uh, to something that's also of concern of mine, um, and it doesn't necessarily relate to uh, active shooter and school uh, and school safety in that regard. But students, and I'm, I'm reading that a student uh, died not too long ago because of a severe allergic reaction to peanuts. Um, so it also speaks to the safety in schools. Um, what are we doing to make sure that the staff and faculty and administrators know how to deal with an emergency such as this? Anaphylaxis, or the, the throat closing up, uh, the, the tissue becomes so inflamed that you can't breathe anymore. And it, it gets so severe that once the breathing stops, the oxygen is cut off and, and, and somebody could die. So what are we doing to be proactive about that? Do our nurses in the schools have EpiPens? Could they administer epinephrine in the event of an emergency like that to help save a student? It's just something to be cognizant about is food allergies. Um, I know in the school that my daughters go to, the signs on the doors of the classrooms that students have allergies and what they're allergic to. So something else with school safety that we need to know about. And reacting to any aided case, should schools have people that are trained in basic first aid or even emergency medical technicians. Um, at the very least, basic first aid. At, at the very least, uh, people being trained on what the emergency response procedure is, which is all discussed during drills. Do we just have drills for fire drills? Well, unfortunately, not anymore today. We have drills for fire. We have drills for school violence. Um, but are we having school drills for how administrators, or what they call also a tabletop exercise, into what's your role in the event of an emergency, whether it's a violent emergency or whether it's an aided case where somebody's sick or injured? What's our response? And it just, it's just a way to get people good at what they're doing so that you could respond to any emergency in a school, especially in a school. School safety is one of my number one priorities. So now, backtracking for a second, we didn't get into the response phase of something bad happening. And again, whether it's school violence, whether it's an aided case, somebody sick or injured, how do we respond now to that? So we've 
talked about the preparation phase and being prepared for an active shooter. They talked about the mitigation or prevention phase, but now what about the response? How are we gonna respond? And that's why the drills, the education, hearing what the professionals have to say is so important. Because now we know how to respond when something happens. Because now the drills are now implemented in a real life scenario and how important it is how we respond. Now the police are the first responders. Emergency medical teams are the first responders. But if there is a security officer in the school, if there's a campus safety officer, they, ver they very well may be the first line of defense or the first people to get themselves involved if there is an injury or an aided case. So they could be the front line, they could be the first responders. But certainly once law enforcement and the professionals, uh, emergency medical come on campus, then everything is deferred to them. And a lot of campuses across the country already have sworn police officers and emergency medical right on campus. But the majority of colleges do not. So we have to talk about the response phase and how do we respond. And response is basically the implementation of what we've learned in the preparedness phase, just putting it into action. The final phase that I'm going to talk about today is recovery. Very difficult thing to talk about because recovering from an event means that something already happened and we have to recover. And how do we recover? There's things called business continuity. It sounds like such a cold expression, but you know, business must go on. Schools must recover in, in after something violent happens. Uh, business must continue, unfortunately. And there's ways that we have to deal with the recovery. So whether it's psychological impact and people going for trauma counseling, uh, which is very important, whether it's how do we recover as an institution from something like that happening. So counseling, obviously, number one. Uh, number two is going back into what's a, uh, an easing back into what's a regular course of business. We recover. We recover, we learn, we console each other, and that's the recovery phase of all of this that I've been speaking about today. But it's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. It's a topic that it's something that I worked in um, when I was in a college. It's something that I'm very involved in here at Arrow Security. Keeping our children safe, keeping our students safe is not something that we could put a price tag on everybody. So just bear that in mind, those two things. We can't put a price tag on our children's safety and don't adapt the NIMBY attitude, not in my backyard, because it can happen in anyone's backyard and that's anywhere across our country and across the globe. And I'm gonna end with that today. You could always tweet me with your comments, um, any suggestions. Um, I always love to lecture at schools and colleges. Um, you can always utilize my services, utilize the services of Arrow Security. We're here for the folks. We're here to keep the students safe. You could tweet me at, at BlangifM. That's at B-L-A-N-G-I-F-M on Twitter with your comments. And uh, I look forward to everybody tuning in again uh, where we'll have more tips on school safety, uh, current events, and everything that's going on around the world. So thanks for tuning in today. This is Cinco de Mayo. I'm Mike Blangiforti, your host, and have a great week, everybody. See you next Monday.